Okay. Okay. Um, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Circle Foundation's webinar. Uh, my name is Enes Güzel, and I'm the president of Circle Foundation. Today, we will be talking about the impact of the election of Joe Biden on the Middle East. And we will be discussing a wide range of issues from Palestine-Israeli conflict to Syrian crisis. As president-elect Joe Biden uh, will take office on January 20 next year, many believe that it could represent a significant change in the US foreign policy from that of the Trump administration. It could change the political calculus of the major players in the Middle East, starting from the fate of the Iranian nuclear agreement, Trump's so-called deal of the century between Israel and Palestine, as well as the normalization agreements between a number of Arab states, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Israel. And we'll be discussing all these issues with our distinguished panel. But before that, uh, let me briefly tell you about the Circle Foundation. Circle Foundation is a newly founded non-profit, independent and non-partisan think tank, focuses on national, regional and international is issues concerning Turkey and UK-Turkey relations. On top of its think tank aspect, Circle Foundation also aims to empower the Turkish speaking diaspora through creating a platform for political integration, civic and democratic participation in the UK. We have a very distinguished panelist joining our to our discussion today, and I'm very delighted to introduce them to you. Uh, today, uh, we are joined by Professor William Hale, who is an Emeritus Professor of Politics at SOAS. Uh, we have the Right Honorable Sir Jeffrey Donaldson, uh, MP, who is the Parliamentary Leader of the Democratic Unionist Party and the Chair of APPG Turkey. Uh, we have Dr. Melania Garson, who is, a, who is a Senior Teaching Fellow in Conflict Resolution and International Security at the University of, University of College London, UCL. We have Akif Çağatay Kılıç, MP, who is a former Minister of Youth and Sport in Turkey and the Chair of Foreign Affairs Commission in the Turkish Parliament, and he's an MP from Istanbul. We have Michael Stephens, who is a Research Fellow for Middle East Studies at Royal United Service Institute, RUTI. And lastly, we have Samuel Ramani, who is a non-resident fellow at the Gulf International Forum and a PhD candidate in politics at the University of Oxford. It's a great honor for me to host them today. So uh, just some housekeeping rules before I turn it uh, over to them. Please ask your questions in the Q&A uh, section in writing, and we will turn to those questions in the second half of the discussion once uh, the other speakers uh, finish their uh, section and we will try to answer them as many as uh, your questions therefore so please feel free to ask as many questions as you would like uh, I think that's everything for now and I will and again I would like to encourage uh, audience participation as much as possible and uh, so I will turn it uh, to over to first our first speaker uh, it's going to be Professor William Hill uh, just to let you let uh, our speakers know that each panelist will be speaking uh, 10 minutes uh, and then we will uh, move on to QA, a Q&A uh, session. Uh, Mr. William Hill, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, especially the ones I, I'm not familiar with. Um, but uh, to start off, I'd like to start making three general uh, points about uh, speculations about Biden's policy in the Middle East. <clears throat> the first of them one is, of course, that foreign policy, especially in the Middle East, will probably be occupying a fairly low priority in, uh, on Biden's agenda uh, for the immediate future once he is sworn in. Um, obviously, the number one issue that he has to ad address is uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic in America and how to uh, bring it to a halt. Uh, and then, of course, allay allied to that, he will have the whole difficult problem of solving the uh, serious economic problems which have been thrown up uh, by the corona coronavirus pandemic. 
The second uh, big uncertainty is, of course, what happens in January in the senatorial elections in Georgia, because if uh, the Republicans uh, succeed in capturing both those Senate seats, or even only one of them in uh, Georgia next, ja next January, then of course, um, Biden will not have a majority in the Senate, and the Senate could act to limit his uh, freedom of action in this and, and many other respects. So uh, one must start off by saying uh, that there's a general caveat to make here. The second general, the third general caveat I have to make uh, is that um, one always has to distinguish, I think, between what presidential uh, candidates say in election campaigns in the United States and elsewhere, uh, and what they actually do uh, once they're in office. Uh, and there could be a, a big difference here. Um, because once uh, they're installed in office, then presidents tend to come under a lot of pressure, both from the Congress and also from the regular people in the administration, uh, the uh, State Department, CIA, and so on. Uh, now, this shouldn't be too much of a problem for Biden, uh, determined to re-establish the role of the, the normal um, decision, uh, decision makers or executive branches here. Um, so he, uh, it, we're, we're in, in, after uh, Trump uh, virtually ignored uh, most of the uh, foreign policy making establishment. So he will uh, need to move on that one. And we don't know how uh, the balance is going to work itself out. <clears throat> There has been a great deal of speculation about how Biden might address the um, Israeli-Arab issue. Uh, this isn't surprising because, of course, this is the issue which probably arouses most concern domestically in the United States. And it's certainly the aspect of Biden's expected policy in the Middle East, which has got more attention in the media in the US than anything else. On the one side, uh, Biden is suggesting that he wants to shift away from several of the Trump policies. In particular, he wants to resume dialogue with the Palestinians. He wants to press Israel not to take action which would prevent a two-state solution. He wants to reopen the US consulate in East Jerusalem. He wants to find a way to reopen the PLO office in Washington if he can, and he also wants to resume aid uh, to the Palestinians, or at any rate, uh, to the PLO and their representatives. So in that respect, we've got a distinct shift in the American position uh, with regard to Israel. On the other hand, Biden, it's suggested, will also not want to withdraw the US embassy from Jerusalem, and he will not want to uh, cut aid to Israel. And it's argued that if he can't do either of these two things, uh, then he can't put the pressure on Israel, which would be required uh, to uh, do the other things he says he wants to do. He is prepared to uh, lever Israel in some way, like, for instance, withdrawing recognition with re 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 restoring the US embassy in Tel Aviv, or uh, for instance, affecting aid to Israel, then there is the Israelis are simply not going to respond. So in other words, the argument here would be uh, Biden has certainly got the right ideas, uh, but the difficulty is here, has he really got the pre prepared to use the weapons he would need in order to put them into reality? The second uh, big issue which has been reported on is the, the, uh, uh, the uh, nuclear deal with Iran, which was signed in, 19, in uh, 2015, the JCPOA, um, and which uh, Trump uh, withdrew from. Uh, Biden has made it clear that he will go back 
uh, to uh, rejoining the JCPOA. Uh, this is, is fine. This is definitely a positive step. Uh, at the moment, however, of course, there is a uh, presidential election coming up in Iran, and we don't know how that is, is going to work out and whether it will be possible uh, to coax Iran back uh, to the negotiating table. On Afghanistan, uh, there really isn't much difference between Biden and uh, Trump, so far as one can tell. He would, would agree, would agree to the withdrawal of the US troops uh, from Afghanistan. On Saudi Arabia, it's uh, reported that he would review relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, that there might be uh, pressure on Saudi Arabia, for instance, over the war in Yemen, that he might uh, cease US arms shipments, which are being used by Saudi Arabia in, in the Yemen. But again, one wonders whether it's possible for any US president uh, to really um, uh, put serious pressure on Saudi Arabia, given its absolutely critical position as an oil producer and as uh, and its visit its security role in in the in the Gulf. For me, the biggest question mark and uncertainty about Biden's uh, possible policies uh, relates to Syria, and it's also the most crucial one. It seems to me, uh, we do know uh, that Antony Blinken. Uh, when he was uh, in the Obama administration back in uh, 2013, uh, strongly opposed um, uh, Obama's uh, decision not to take action against Bashar al-Assad over the use of sarin gas. This, uh, in Lincoln's view, and I would fully agree with him here, was a very serious mistake, uh, but it's very, very difficult to correct that mistake, because the effect is that over the last five years, uh, Russia has effectively established itself um, as the dominant external actor in Syria. And uh, America has, in effect, been pushed to the sidelines. There has been a dramatic reduction of American power in Syria and in Iraq uh, over the last five years. Biden says he wants to work towards a settlement in Syria, but he also wants to keep the U.S. troops there in northeastern Syria. And um, it's hard to see uh, how he expects the whole thing to work out. He, he, there doesn't seem to be an end game here. Uh, and equally, uh, what will he do if, for example, uh, Bashar, with possibly support from Russia, attacks uh, the uh, area held by the uh, PDY, YPG Kurdish forces in northeastern Syria in collaboration uh, with the Americans. Uh, will uh, the United States be prepared to put a massive troop deployment into Syria in order to defend that situation? My guess is not. So that it seems to me there are some very serious uncertainties about the U.S. position on Syria. And unfortunately, there's been very, very little discussion uh, or elucidation of what Biden's policies on this might be. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of my remarks. My apologies for the technical problems in the middle. Thank you very much, uh, Professor William Hale. Uh... We will move to uh, Sir Jeffrey Donaldson, uh, MP, uh, for uh, the uh, sec uh, second speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Ennis, and thank you to Professor Hale. That was very interesting indeed. Um, and I, I want to begin by echoing uh, what Professor Hale said. Um, uh, you will gather from my accent, I'm from Northern Ireland, and I've had many years of experience in dealing with American presidents in the context of the Northern Ireland peace process. And I agree entirely with what Professor Hill said. Um, first of all, um, the, we shouldn't underestimate the role of Congress and the Senate, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Too often, commentators put a focus on, 
on who is the president, but in terms of American foreign policy, um, the Congress has a big role to play in all of that. And um, uh, if, as might be expected, um, the Republicans hold the, um, the majority in the Senate, that will have a significant impact on um, President Biden's ability to develop his, his own foreign policy um, without reference to Congress. Uh, secondly, um, again, I agree with Professor Hale that uh, election rhetoric should not be read uh, as translating into policy uh, when it comes to actually taking office. And we found this in Northern Ireland because of course the United States of America has a huge Irish American population. And very often during elections, president, presidential candidates will play to the gallery. Um, but when it comes to translating things that they say in the heat of the campaign into actual policy, I think you will find it's quite different. And uh, I think with a president, a, a Biden presidency, um, I wouldn't uh, focus too much on the rhetoric uh, that took place during the election when it comes to Turkey or when it comes to the region. And I would focus more on what are the limitations of the presidency and uh, what, what is its capacity to influence events in the region. Um, as chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on Turkey here in the UK parliament, I would want to say that for the, for, uh, the UK, Turkey is a really important and strategic player in, in the region. And we recognize that. And I think post-Brexit, we want to strengthen our relationship uh, with Turkey. Um, that won't come without its difficulties and its challenges. But I think it's important to say that we recognize the strategic importance, the geopolitical strategic importance of Turkey in the region. I think the Biden presidency will also recognize that. Um, what that means in terms of the relationship and how it develops, of course, remains to be seen. I expect a Biden presidency, as Professor Hill said, will, um, will engage more um, towards uh, building a Middle East peace process. I think that is long overdue. Um, I take a keen interest in the Middle East and in the peace process or lack thereof. I think it was uh, Shimon Peres, the former Israeli prime minister, who when referring to the Middle East um, said, um, the good news is there is light at the end of the tunnel. The bad news is there is no tunnel. In other words, um, yes, we've got peace rallies and we have people who want and hope for peace, but we don't have a process to deliver it. And I think a big challenge for a Biden presidency is going to be helping to design and construct a process um, for um, uh, a dialogue, a negotiation in the Middle East. That will not be easy. Um, and I think that um, countries like Turkey, um, can have some influence in that. Um, uh, of late, um, there has been a lot of criticism about Turkey's role in Syria, Turkey's role in the region generally, but I think that Turkey um, it, it does have an opportunity, if it chooses to take that opp opportunity, to step up and be a key influencer um, uh, in, in the region. Um, uh, and to enhance its reputation if it takes a constructive role, a constructive role in promoting um, a dialogue, uh, a peace process in the Middle East. Um, I think that's crucially important because the stability of the entire region, of course, is linked to the prospect of creating that tunnel, that negotiating process uh, in the Middle East between the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. I think a Biden presidency will put a major focus on how you bring about that process. Um, and uh, some of the big players in the region can have an influence on that. So I think that um, uh, just to wind up my initial comments, um, I mean, there's a lot happening in the region, Syria, and uh, where things go there um, already, the, the uh, events, the, 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 the political challenges uh, with Iran, um, 
the, the ongoing uh, refugee crisis in the region. Um, these are all major challenges, not, not um, withstanding the Middle East peace process and the need for progress on that. So I think that Turkey, if it desires, can play an important role, but it has to put its diplomatic hat on. It, it has got to um, be willing to embrace the opportunity that I see to be a major influencer and player as the Biden presidency looks at the Middle East, uh, looks towards in particular uh, the prospect of designing and constructing a Middle East peace process. Thank you very much, uh, Sir uh, Jeffrey Donaldson. Uh, before we move to uh, Mr. Akif Çağatay Kılıç, uh, Professor William Hill, can you hear me? You just need to turn on your mic. Okay, it's fine. Uh, now we will move to uh, Mr. Akif Çağatay Kılıç. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, good evening from uh, from Istanbul in Turkey. We have already 10.30 p.m. here, so it's quite a late time, uh, but it's nice to join you. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, say a very good evening to all our panelists and also the participants. Um, and I would like to start off on a short note. Um, by saying that, of course, the heading of the panel is uh, how will or rather can uh, Joe Biden as the president elect of um, and the president now of the United States change the future of the Middle East for good? I think there is um, not criticizing uh, you particularly as the foundation, however, there is, I think, in the world, a general perception that a president alone can uh, or could be, uh, in the sense of the American uh, system, as uh, my colleagues who spoke before me said, that the president has such a power to do. Um, there are a lot of things that have to be um, taken into account. And I don't think that the world today is the world that uh, the American presidents were looking at in the 70s and the 80s, the 90s, not even in the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, the world is a much more uh, different place than it was then. By that I mean uh, no one country can see itself as the problem solver of everything and cannot think that one country is the police force, the gendarmerie, whatever you want to call it, of the world. Now, we have a particular strange situation in the Security Council of the United Nations already that five countries are deciding on the, on the Security Council's decisions. That in itself has to be addressed in these days because the world is not the world uh, it was in, in 1945 and certainly not the world it was after the First World War. So. Uh, meaning that by, by that I mean the world system has changed from those days. There was the mention of the Turkish foreign policy or the general policy, foreign policy of Turkey and it being on a more constructive manner. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of things that we can talk about. I don't, I only have about 10 minutes to start in the opening. Um, I believe Turkey's foreign policy is constructive as ever. However, the reality is Turkey is putting forward ideas and policies that are not very much liked by some. And by that I mean, for example, in the current situation in the, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean, or also in the some other parts of the region, and Turkey is pursuing its constructive policy as it has before. However, it's saying some things are not acceptable and will not be accepted. There's a difference here, I believe, uh, in being um, in being open and on the 
Sorry, Mr. Kılıç, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, now we solve the technical issue, the problem. I think everyone can uh, be enabled to uh, turn on the video. So I think all our panelists can uh, turn on uh, their video. Okay. They try, I think it's gonna work out. Okay, perfect. Okay. And sir, jo Jeffrey everybody, Donaldson. Everybody can see okay. everybody now, that's good. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. finally. Uh, Sorry for the no, okay. technical problem. That's okay. And um, of course, when we look at the, uh, when we talk about the situation in the region, then we have to take into account not only what the American policies or institutions are going to be, but we also have to take into account what uh, the general situation in the countries are in the region is going to be. Uh, the mentioning of Syria was, was made twice. And we have our differences in how we see what is happening in Syria. Um, I, for one, don't believe that the Americans are uh, there to uh, solve a lot. I mean, uh, they're not there in order to uh, enable certain things. Uh, they have found themselves there. They were counting on to be there this long. And now they have in their perception or had a partner in some uh, groups, which we see as threats to Turkish and regional security, an offshoot of the PKK terrorist organization, and they're handling with them in some issues. Now we know that in the past, America has dropped arms into the region. Uh, we have seen how that played out. I mean, dropping uh, ammunition and weapons from the air is not going to solve anything on the ground other than giving all these weapons and uh, ammunitions into the wrong hands. Um, so the question of terrorist organizations that are running amok in the region some places, in some places, is something that has to be addressed, a security issue. Um, if you don't address the security issue correctly, as has been done so far from, from the US's point of view and some of our European um, NATO members as well, then you cannot resolve the situation. The, um, uh, the definitions have to be made correctly in order to have a result. Now you can look at this from a different point of angle, uh, but the end result is going to be that there is more, there's going to be more chaos here rather than less. Um, and I, nobody wants that. And nobody wants to have uh, a situation like that. So I believe in the end, in the, in the long run, the American foreign, foreign policy regarding the Middle East and the South European region has to learn the lessons from the second term of President Obama, uh, where Joe Biden was the vice president. Now they made the mistakes together in their last term. I hope they can learn from those mistakes and not repeat them. Iran was mentioned. There was also an, a deal with Iran before 2015 and America backed out on, on that uh, the deal at the last minute. Now, we have a lot of examples in the past where there were some interesting turns in American foreign policy. But once again, I would like to stress that it is in this world no more uh, possible for one country, be it the American, Americans or other countries, you can say Russia, America, um, Saudi Arabia was mentioned, Iran was mentioned, Turkey, nobody can resolve issues here by themselves. But most of all, issues in the Middle East are going to be resolved in the, in the Middle East. Not in Washington, not in Moscow, not in London, not in Berlin, not in Paris, but here in the region. So it is important that we understand that and refer, refrain from trying to be like, let's say a general manager to everybody who is living here. I think that will go a long way. And I hope, like I said, Joe Biden will have uh, seen this. He would have experienced this. He had a long time since 2016 to look back on his vice presidency and what he has done or not done. Um, but one thing is for sure, we are always constru constructive, but it has to be understood. There's a difference between being constructive and speaking one's opinion out very loudly. Now, if we go into other, other things, I know that Joe Biden is very close with the Greek uh, 
uh, diaspora in the US, but it's not going to help to resolve any frictions that we have with Greece uh, today um, if Joe Biden starts to mingle in this issue. Like, for example, the EU is mingling. Now, there is a, dis there is a misunderstanding between Malta and Italy in the, Mediter in the Mediterranean. And the EU is saying, well, that's the issue of Italy and Malta. We are not going to interfere in this. But when it, when it comes to Turkey and Greece disagreeing on certain things, the EU somehow stands now behind Greece, which is not resolving anything. So what I mean is, and what I'm trying to say is, uh, if you don't look at the, at, the, at the situation from a correct perspective, but rather than uh, look at it from, let's say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you will not be able to resolve anything in the region. I'll stop there because there's a lot of panelists that are also going to speak. So we can go on in the question and answer. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kalic. And I will also encourage all our uh, participants, uh, because we got, we got a lot of, of them, uh, to uh, send their questions through the Q&A section. And uh, as our next speaker, we, we will be moving on a little bit uh, far away from Turkey. Uh, now, Dr. Melania Garson will be our uh, next speaker. And the floor is yours, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you need to turn off your mic. We can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> now I can mute myself. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, it's uh, lovely to be here with you. And um, to its um, Interesting enough, like the pre previous speaker uh, highlighted, uh, the question or the name of the panel, can uh, Biden change the Middle East for good, um, raises a whole host of questions. And of course, it always takes you back to uh, that old joke to some extent is uh, how many psychiatrists does it change to change a light bulb? Well, the light bulb has got to want to change first. And, and that is very much part of the process in any event of what happens in the Middle East. Can he contribute to lasting change in the Middle East? Absolutely. Um, some of our previous panelists, Professor Hale at Sadanson, have highlighted the constraints coming from the domestic side that can affect his the limits of his capability. But let's just sort of control for that a little bit and say in an optimal world, he has that backing to be able to engage. What does that look like and what can that engagement look like? And we've already seen that he's uh, put together, he's brought together a professional, a pragmatic team that's already talking about committing with a certain measure of honesty into uh, all foreign policy, including the Middle East. And what we can hope or begin to see from that is some sort of return to certainty in the steps that the United States take. Anyone that deals with international security knows that the enemy of, inter of security is uncertainty. And having had a number of years of quixotic leadership where we're not quite sure where or the hit and miss levels of policy, a return from a more steady certainty or being able to have a certain level of predictability of approach will begin to uh, contribute to some shifts within the region. If we're going to also uh, think of what is critical is that we have this tried and tested team and if you look at a lot of the media that's looking at what will the Biden team do, they're constantly talking about well looking backwards and I think the key element is uh, for this experienced team is it's not about re-entering an old deal and it's not about restarting uh, something's old process it goes back to that Einstein definition of what is lunacy is to keep doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome I think the challenge for this team is to really look at what's been look at what's not been successful look at the circumstances on the ground which have shifted 
with coronavirus. So it has shifted with people's attitudes to feeling the sense of a global threat that's been uncontrollable outside of the realm of conventional weapons that we're used to dealing with a security threat. And think about how can we maximize that and how can we uh, create a new set of policies, a new set of vision going forward. And just in the sense of, so when we first spoke, uh, you asked me to think about uh, to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And to some extent, the shift to Biden alone has allowed for a certain level or will allow for a certain level of re-engagement just because the deal of the century was dead before the deal was made. You can't ever have a deal with parties without the parties participating in the negotiation. The first rule of conflict resolution is the people that live the peace have to make the peace. And that is, uh, and it can't happen any other way. But, and even if it was the best deal of the world, the previous rhetoric did not allow the Palestinians to engage without a certain level of bending the knee to Trump, which wasn't going to happen. So just the shift in personalities will allow that channel to begin to open up. But that's still predicated opening up that pr uh, process that Sir Donaldson was referring to is very much dependent upon there still have to be critical shifts in the Palestinian leadership as well. There still has to be anybody that comes to the table has to be able to sell that agreement to the people. They have to carry the authority of the people. They have to carry the will of the people and they have to be able to commit that people will abide by the agreement. And I think what Joe Biden can bring is he stood on a platform and whilst we talk about election rhetoric, but he's talked about it being inherent in himself of being a unifier, of being someone that stands by values leadership. We've had a shift, a, a sad loss of Saeb Arakat in the Palestinian leadership. It's a, the loss of that kind of fa figure leaves a big psychological vacuum. But I think the challenge, not just in and Palestine, but and I think it's going to have to be even handed. So there's already the talk of how is the engagement with Saudi Arabia predicated on still insistence on human rights, insistence on um, a different level of values within the leadership. And that has to go throughout. And I think this uh, inspiring or demanding in some respects of engaging with leadership that is committing to values, committing to governance, committing to uh, really wanting to be part of rebuilding. Um, and this goes across the board in any of the societies that um, engaging with within foreign policy, but particularly within the peace process, that you have to have an active, vibrant leadership and emp empowering that active, vibrant leadership that can participate in negotiations going forward. And I think there's also, I'd said, um, Professor Hale and Sir Donaldson also alluded to the challenges of funding within to the uh, Middle East when he's run on a platform or where there is the immediate need of funding in the US to fight the coronavirus and to the extent that foreign aid into any countries or foreign, it's channeling out how that will be viewed domestically. But certainly within, uh, again, there's the talk with, well, uh, will Biden immediately refund UNRWA? And I would say that the challenge, again, is not to start looking backwards. There were, whilst there was good done by UNRWA, there was a lot of critique about the way it operated. And is this now a critical point where actually when you're re-engaging with something like refunding, to actually stop and look and say, well, how can this refunding be done better? How can funding be made sure that it's going to the right places? Can we predicate funding on these critical elements within conflict resolution in any the Middle East and beyond in that we need the reduced, uh, reducing hatred rhetoric? We ne it needs to be funded. It's not just about the physical security. It's also about the psychological security for all parties that are engaged in any kind of process. So thinking about can funding 
take control of the 668 schools that UNRWA uh, has and is not using UN or UNESCO mandated textbooks? And how can we move a process forward to not just think four years ahead and not just think uh, eight years ahead, but really to thinking sort of future proofing and thinking we're on the cusp of massive exponential change in the way that we live from everything from our interconnectivity in smart cities, in the threat vectors we have, in the way that we're going to wage war, and how are we actually providing for a policy within the Middle East that is accounting for all those factors. So I think it's uh, the challenge here of this, a, a, a team with incredible experience, is to not move backwards, but actually to look at the possible avenues to get processes, whether it's with Saudi, whether it's expanding the relationships between Israel and opening up with uh, the Gulf states and other Arab states to create those critical alliances that help balance the region, whether it's looking at an Iran deal that's not just standing still. And Blinken's quite good at this. He has admitted, like uh, uh, was pointed out, uh, that he, the mistake was made with Syria, with looking at what was the good that could be achieved and not to sit back, not to move backwards, but to actually move forwards and move forwards with a a bigger vision of than the next electoral cycle. Thank you very much, Dr. Melanie Garson, for those uh, important remarks. And uh, we will move to Michael Stephens from Ruti. Michael, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Michael, uh, we can't hear you as well. You need to... Okay, is it, is it me? Let me see. Uh, I think you can you can unmute yourself. No. Okay, let's then let's move to. Okay, I will I will try to sort this out. And uh, Samuel, can you can you turn your Mike, no. Unmute. Okay. On. Can you hear me? I think we can. We can oh, hear Mike I can as, well. Unmute so, as well. Okay. Okay. Should we go? Should we go back to me? Is that all right? Okay. Sam, is that okay? Yeah, for sure. No worries. All right. Thanks, Sam. Cheers. Okay. So um, let's talk about what Biden may or may not do. Um, I think that we have a bit of a moving target at the moment. The Trump administration, despite the fact that Donald Trump seems to think that he's won this election and is continuing to behave as if he's won this election, his administration is behaving in a way which indicates that he's lost and that there are only a few weeks left to essentially secure some results in the region that I think would be considered wins for the Trump administration. So what you've seen is hyperactive diplomacy in the last couple of weeks, which is effectively going to lock the US administration into a couple of pathways that I think it will be very difficult to reverse from. You have seen with the encouragement of Mike Pompeo, who by the way, appears to be running some sort of Pompeo 2024 campaign um, and visiting the region whilst making his own proclamations and leaving Trump to tweet about um, the general election results back home an attempt to accelerate um, a regional vision of the Trump administration in which you effectively have a stronger arc built against the Iranians. That is brought together by increased relationships between Israel and the Gulf states. Um, we obviously have the Abraham Accords, but it's quite clear what happened at the beginning of this week or uh, last week was that uh, Mohammed bin Salman met Benjamin Netanyahu and Mike Pompeo on Saudi soil. At the same time, with American encouragement, you have the Saudis re-engaging with Qatar to try and fix what looks to me this almost intractable uh, dispute which has gone on between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is designed to build 
a strengthened position vis-a-vis -vis Iran, which will effectively prevent the Biden administration from engaging along the lines of the JCPOA uh, that Tony Blinken has been talking about, that Jake Sullivan has been talking about, that Daniel Benayne has been referring to. So in these six weeks, I think what we will see is the final dying embers of the Trump administration trying to create long-term realities on the ground, which ensures that their preferences basically dominate for as long as possible. Where do I think that leaves the Biden administration in terms of its options for the Middle East? Well, actually, it's not a bad um, regional compact, if you like. Any deal signed between Israel and the Arab states is actually very positive for Israel. Obviously, the United States, and by virtue of Biden's position, as he keeps repeating himself as a strong friend of Israel, is a good result for a Biden administration. If it comes to pass that you have more regional cooperation uh, between uh, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, I would suggest that the UAE is a little bit outside of that debate, um, but also Israel, then you will have effectively regional states doing the United States' uh, forward planning for it. I do not expect that under a Biden administration, you will see this turning away from the Middle East in the way that seems to be so fashionable in uh, Washington DC at the moment. This seems to be the rage amongst the commentariat that the US is bored of the Middle East, the US is leaving the Middle East. I'm afraid I don't see that. I think CENTCOM is going to be incredibly active for a number of reasons. One, Afghanistan is still going and most operations and command and control for Afghanistan operations come out of Doha. Um, secondly, you still have problems in Syria with the presence of Al Qaeda in the Northwest. Iraq is hardly looking stable at the moment. In fact, the Iraqis are on course to run out of money by May next year, in which case it's anybody's guess as to what that state looks like with regards to its stability vis-a-vis -vis either terrorist organizations operating there or Iranian influence, which seems to be uh, pervasive. You then have the situation of the ongoing war in Yemen, in which the Houthis don't look to be backing down anytime soon. And there, I think you've got a number of regional issues that frankly behoove a US presence. So the US can say or can situate its Middle East policy within a framework of saying, well, we need to do more on China. We need to focus on European security and the threat of Russia. That's all well and good. And it's clear that the great geopolitical questions of the day leave the Middle East in a distant third place. That's, that's, not, that's not in doubt. But to say that somehow the Biden administration will be able to remove itself from the Middle East, I think is, is wishful thinking. I think that actually in counterflow to that, you have a number of Biden administrations which do want to re-engage uh, with Iran in a way which includes looking at regional questions to do with Iran's activities in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, which were not addressed in 2014 and 2015. Now, it's no doubt in my mind that regional states like Israel, uh, which I think we can all say uh, was probably responsible for what happened with the assassination of the scientists this week, um, but also Saudi Arabia and the UAE, will be looking to push back against Iranian uh, activity in the region wherever they can. They will expect US support. And I think what you will find is in order to back a new JCPOA or a reformed JCPOA, there will have to be input from regional states first. So we've seen this from Bahrain, from the UAE and from Saudi Arabia, all saying the same thing, which is that we need to be consulted. If you're going to talk to Iran, we need to be consulted. Our interests need to be heard. And one of the reasons I think that they were so against the JCPOA was not because they were upset with sunset clauses, that they were upset with enrichment volumes. You know, I, I did a lot of research in the Gulf states looking at what about the Iran nuclear deal they didn't like. And it was very clear after spending about a year doing this that there were no real technical aspects of the deal that they disliked. What they disliked was the fact that it gave the Iranians a free pass to act in the region with basic impunity. Um, and I think as it's come to pass, what we've seen, of course, is a region in which Iran has strengthened its regional position. The Trump administration has taken some sort of max pressure strategy, but it's been inconsistent, unevenly applied. Occasionally you get an airstrike against Bashar al-Assad, but no follow-up. You get an airstrike against Qasem Soleimani, but no follow-up. 
um, and you get sort of bellicose rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but it doesn't look much like any kind of strategy with a defined end goal. The difference with the Biden administration will be that there will be a clearly defined end goal. There will be clearly defined rules of engagement. Now, I think what was so dangerous about Qasem Soleimani's um, assassination uh, earlier this year is that we simply did not know how this would escalate, whether Iran and the US really would tip over the edge into some sort of conflict because there were no rules. I think what the Biden administration will try to do very early on is set out what those rules are, by which way it will respond to an attack, say, against Saudi Arabia or its oil institutions, against Israel, perhaps through Hezbollah, or what they will do in terms of their regional security in the Persian Gulf, um, if there is some kind of disruption to oil flows or some kind of attempt to mine the Straits of Hormuz, which the Iranians talk about very frequently, but very rarely do anything about. So that is what I expect. And other speakers have talked about this, about some kind of better understanding of the rules of the game. Can the US unilaterally change the Middle East, especially after four years of a Trump administration? No, they can't. Of course they can't. You're right to say, I, I remember it was the, the Turkish speaker. I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but you are absolutely right to say one country is no longer in a position where it can have universal hegemonic influence in the Middle East. Um, that era is gone. But I also think that the US still is the dominant military power. So it's a question of where does it put and focus its military efforts? What kind of end states does it want to achieve? Does it want counterterrorism operations to go on forever in Syria? Does it want counterterror operations to go on forever in Iraq? What is its appetite for ending the Yemen war? We don't know the answers to any of these questions. What would be useful is if the Biden administration would start to give some of those answers and some of those frameworks. So I hate to give a sort of unclear answer, but it is a moving target at the moment. When the Biden administration comes in, in January the 21st, things will have changed from today. And that is because of what the Trump administration is doing. So um, I think we can safely say that it will be a more stable approach to the Middle East. Will it be a correct approach to the Middle East? I think that's a very subjective uh, uh, thing that I'm not sure most people will agree on. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so we will move to our last uh, speaker, Samuel. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you all for all your excellent presentations. And I'm going to kind of uh, turn the focus a little bit. I'm going to be focusing today on uh, North Africa, which is a region that we really haven't discussed that much within MENA. And broadly, I would agree with the uh, propositions that have been put out so far. Uh, there's a limit to what Biden can do. There's a limit to what any US president can do to change longstanding trajectories of foreign policy. So in North Africa, I don't see anything really drastic changing. I don't think there's gonna be a major break in any partnerships. I don't think the US is suddenly gonna go from pretty much a near complete disengagement under Trump into something much more proactive, but I see changes happening on the margins. Now, what do I mean by this? I think that there could be a greater attention towards human rights, particularly in the context of Egypt. And there could also be a greater uh, renewed and double down focus on great power competition. So what we've seen nascently developing uh, with Mark Esper's visit to Algeria, where he sought to contain Russia and China at once, we'll start to see more of those kind of pushes, anti-Russian and anti-Chinese. The problem is that these objectives could prove to be contradictory because one of the appeals of Russia and China for countries like Algeria, for countries like Egypt, is that they prize non-interference in the internal affairs of states. They don't really care about human rights. So if the United States wants to push the button on human rights and challenge great powers, it could find it has to sacrifice one or the other. And I think based on past experience, based on how the Obama administration handled the uh, post-Arab Spring and the, uh, the 2013 coup, human rights will be the plank that will, be, you know, that will get sacrificed. So I'll start with Egypt very briefly. Obviously, Egypt has become something of a partisan issue in the United States because of uh, Donald Trump calling uh, President Sisi his favorite dictator. And, but, and so I think that there could be a little bit of a cooling of the relationship. And I think we've already seen that from Egyptian media commentaries that followed uh, Biden's election. The uh, pro Sisi uh, activists were uh, trying to entertain some of Donald Trump's claims about electoral fraud. They were 
and where they were actually being very critical of Biden. There's one Egyptian broadcaster, for example, who was criticizing Biden for being senile, having Alzheimer's. And then the Biden election call was made and CC congratulated him. And mid broadcast, he switched to basically talking about how there's going to be a good partnership with the US and saying praiseworthy things. So there is a, within the CC inner circle, there's a lot of ambivalence, there's a lot of uncertainty. Amongst the opposition figures, more liberal elements, the Muslim Brotherhood, there's hopes of perhaps uh, a breath of fresh air, a CC Muslim Brotherhood consolidation and dialogue. Of course, I think that that's a little bit too optimistic. I think that the state perspective may be a little bit too pessimistic. We're likely going to see something in between. There could be some pressure on Egypt, particularly with regards to uh, foreign aid, if, if they violate human rights abuses. There could be a more stronger enforcement of the Countering American Through Adversary Sanctions Act, so on Egyptian purchases of Russian military equipment, like some of the uh, jet purchases that we saw recently. And there would certainly be a harder stance, perhaps, on Egyptian clandestine trade or illicit arms movements into Libya, or their purchases from North Korea in the past, or their bellicose conduct, like their tri intervention from Egypt into Eastern Libya. So that, mil that uh, military intervention or destabilizing posturing there could be viewed quite negatively, just like the way the, the Turks' uh, involvement in Syria was criticized by the Biden team, that could be considered negative too. So there could be more pressure on some of the bellicose aspects on Libya, illicit trading deals, Russian sanctions, and human rights. But nothing that could lead to more than temporary aid plus moments or cuts, and certainly no real prospect of sanctions. But I also think there could be some prospects of real cooperation between the United States and Egypt, which could assuage some of the government elements that are a little bit concerned about them. First of all, if Biden wants to restart the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, engaging Egypt is always going to be a good thing. And Egypt's going to be keen to show that its support for the Abraham Accords and uh, tightening relationship with Israel has not seen it lose this kind of pan-Arabist uh, vision. Second, Blinken has been interested in taking a stronger, more assertive US approach towards Africa. Russia, as we've seen, has used Egypt as the gateway to Africa through the Sochi summit. Maybe there could be more engagement with the United States and Egypt on African affairs. On the Grand Renaissance Dam dispute, I think the US could play a mediation role, but it would also check in Egypt's worst and most belligerent impulses, like the threat to bomb the Ethiopian Dam. And you certainly won't see erratic policies like Trump cutting $100 billion in aid to Ethiopia or siding with Egypt in a press conference. That stability that comes from a Biden administration will probably make that cooperative. On the Eastern Mediterranean, there's a pro-Greece sentiment within Biden's administration that could tilt it that way. And on Red Sea security, if the US uh, withdraws from Yemen and there's also withdrawal from Somalia, giving Al-Shabaab and the Houthis free reign on the maritime lines, US and Egypt could cooperate on maritime security in the Red Sea. We see Red Sea cooperation in Palestine and Eastern Mediterranean could be three areas of cooperation. So there's actual, so actually some even, even more positives than negatives in the US-Egypt relationship. Transitioning now a bit west to Tunisia, nothing much will change. It just depends on the US relationship with the Gulf. The UAE and Qatar are the main interferers there. And if there's a saudi Qatar dispute that doesn't bring the Emirates along, nothing much will change there. So Tunisia, I don't see any changes. With Libya, this is going to be an interesting question. Blinken was a supporter of the US military intervention against Gaddafi. Joe Biden's position on this was rather more ambiguous. He praised Gaddafi's death as a new chapter for Libya at the time, but in 2016, he started talking about how he was the voice of moderation and he was trying to keep people in check. So we really don't know where Biden stood or stands on that intervention today that much. So I, but I don't think we're going to see a massive increase in American involvement in Libya, diplomatically, in terms of disengagement. What we could see is greater pressure on Russia's role in the conflict. So there'll be more sanctions than Evgeny Prigozhin, and some of those sanctions might extend to the Libyan national donors, or even some isolated Emirati and Saudi donors who fund the Wagner Group, which is the private military contractor company that has been carrying out Haftar's offensive and the, the, the use of landmines, chemical weapons, and also attacks on civilians. So there's a lot of bad human rights aspects from them. So they could be targeting Russia and the external financiers of the Wagner Group, but probably nothing that's going to hit the governments of Egypt or the governments of Saudi Arabia or the UAE or France, who are the main supporters of Haftar. So there'll be sanctions that will show a symbolic message rather than anything more concrete. Fadi Bashaga, the Libyan interior minister, wants the United States to build a base in Libya to counter a prospective Russian base. Certainly in the Democratic House, there's been talk about what a Russian base in Libya might mean, whether it would mean the obstruction of the European and American and NATO 
uh, shipments and uh, freedom of navigation of the Mediterranean, whether it would mean the Russians will establish a base in Tobruk or Benghazi and use Libya's place as a destination for illegal immigration as something of a blackmail tool, like Gaddafi tried to do 10 years ago, basically asking for a payment or we're going to send immigrants in. There's some concerns about the building of a Russian base. If Russia moves in that direction towards a permanent installation, we could see the Americans get more involved with either a, resp a parallel response with a facility of their own, or at least greater diplomatic involvement to squeeze out Russia. But as of now, I really don't see much will change. I think there'll be less of a willingness to listen though to the Emiratis and to Sisi, because it seems as if Trump's policy seems to be coming through phone calls with Mohammed bin Zayed and phone calls with Sisi, whereas I think the American position could shift towards Turkey a little bit more. So that's what I see with Libya. Not much change, more pressure on Russia, closer to the Turkish stance than the Emirati Egyptian stance. And, uh, and it was really, uh, there's really not been much in terms of policy statements. So I don't want to make anything more definitive. Now Algeria and Morocco, where I'm going to wrap up. There was a lot of concern in Algeria about the uh, Biden victory, in particular because he was seen to be hostile to the Polisario Front, and he was seen to be having a very close relationship with Morocco. The Moroccans were greeting it very celebratory. I think, however, there's really not going to be much change over there. The Americans are going to basically try to carve out something of a middle ground in the West Sahara conflict, probably rhetorically supporting Morocco, but not really doing too much. They would certainly probably try to deter the Moroccans from engaging in an offensive. In terms of great power competition, Algeria, there, there's going to be no grand design where Algeria is going to abandon its ties with China or abandon its ties with Russia. And any attempt to do that will really provoke the Algerians because they desire non-interference probably more than almost any other country in that region. But there could be some limited cooperation that we see. So I spoke to an Algerian analyst uh, last week and uh, he basically told me that Townsend and AFRICOM's efforts to urge the Algerians not to cooperate with Russia in southwestern Libya proved to be successful. So piecemeal efforts, limited efforts to scale back Algerian cooperation with Russia and China where possible, and uh, China maybe on telecommunications, Russia, uh, Russia on Libya, and alternative offers of, of security or economic assistance could be the way forward for US-Algeria relations. I still don't think the Algerians are gonna move away from buying Russian arms. After all, Russia, more than half of their arms to the entire continent comes through there. They're certainly gonna fight for those very strongly. So overall, I don't see, I see minor changes. That's what I'm saying. I think they may be more optimistic than we might think for Egypt. I think Libya is gonna be, and Tunisia are gonna be much of the same. Algeria and Morocco is gonna be you know, much of the same too. So thank you for giving me the chance to talk about this. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Samuel, and I would like to thank all our uh, speakers for their uh, important remarks. Um, so we can move on to the Q&A section. Uh, the let's, let me ask the first question to Professor Hale. Uh, there is a one question directed at him. Would you say Biden's administration will mean less drone strikes, not just in comparison to Trump's administration, but even Obama's? And let me also uh, combine this with another question. You know, how uh, the Syrian policy of the US would differ from uh, the previous the Trump administration uh, in, uh, compared to Biden? I'm extremely sorry. Um, <clears throat> I didn't catch what you were saying. I have a problem with the distortion of your voice. Could you say the question again? <laughs> Slowly, so I can sure. understand. Thank you very much. Would you say Biden's administration will mean less drone strikes, not just in comparison to Trump's administration, but even Obama's? Uh, if you look at if you look at the Q and A section, can you see on the uh, bottom? There's a section. Yes. Uh, yes. There is a yes. question. Q and uh, A. There's a, there's a question down Sir, there. Uh, which one is it? There is an anonymous, anonymous attendee by asking to you, Professor Hale. Just down, down oh, I see. Yeah. If we, in the event we see a strong retaliatory response from Iran with respect to the recent assassinations, what type of reaction could we expect from Biden? I have really no idea. I don't know whether he's even thought about that. I'm extremely sorry. I can't answer the question. Uh, do you want me to tackle the next one? How will uh, Biden's 
team address the BDS movement in America? That I don't know anything about either. I'm so sorry. There is a, sir, there is a specific question on uh, the Cyprus. Uh, the, you know, did you did you see that from Charles Ramstan? Oh, oh, Cyprus. Yeah. Um, no, I can't see a question okay. about Cyprus. Okay, it's just there's a uh, down there. It's fine. Open. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I okay, can't no see. No worries. I'm very sorry. So, uh, so my my my. My next question will be to uh, Mr. Akif Shahtai Kılıç. Uh, so there is a, a question uh, in regards to Turkey, the US relations. So uh, how Biden plans to bridge the gap between America and the EU created by Trump? How will that affect relations with Turkey? What direction will greater proximity with the EU, US-Turkish relations? And uh, another question is, uh, Biden during his election campaign threatened the president, president of Turkey with sanctions if it didn't back down in Syria and Libya. Was that an election strategy or will he oversee NATO's strong partner in the region? Sorry, the first one was about Cyprus, is that right? Uh, I, I'm extremely sorry. Um, it's fine. Uh, I really, I'm sorry about this, but there is a real problem with your voice. I can't hear properly what you're saying. Uh, so could you please try asking questions to the sorry other participants? Maybe they don't have the same technical problem I do. It's fine, Professor Hale. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm now asking uh, another question to another uh, panelist, so I will come back to you. Another speaker, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mr. Kilic, yeah, we can, we can hear you. Can hear you. A question, but I couldn't get your first. Let me first answer the second, and then I'll ask you again about the first question. Okay. 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 So there's really um, a distortion in the voice, and sometimes it comes not very good, but I did understand the second. Well, it was said before on the panel that uh, American presidents, for that matter, some other politicians as well, do tend to speak about things in their election campaigns and then do the quite opposite in office. Uh, now, looking at Joe Biden's past experiences that we had, um, he apologized to President Erdogan twice as vice president of the US for one for his remarks uh, and one as he was president not being and totally open and uh, steadfast in the response to the attempted coup attempt on the 15th of July, 2016. Now this was when he was in office. Uh, so I can see, I would think that, and the, um, the phrase that you're referring to was made even before he was a uh, candidate of the Democratic Party. And he was trying to sort of touch to everybody and get a feel from everybody and try to look very, very um, nice and get votes from everybody. So there is unfortunately this kind of, of attitude in some political circles. And I think this will be one of them because in what he said there is totally unacceptable. He knows it by himself. Uh, what he referred to was that, um, that, he should, that they should be supporting the opposition in Turkey and make this uh, public in order to change uh, the government in Turkey by elections. Now, uh, we know, as I said, this is not possible in today's world anymore. It might have been in the past. I don't know if the Americans did it in some other countries, um, but it is, this is not possible in, in, in Turkey these days anymore. And for that matter, I think in, in a lot of countries. But this is the, the mindset that I was referring to. And uh, Dr. Garrison also said not to look in the past, but into the future. Now, I believe that too. However, to explain some of the attitudes that many of our panelists referred to, it is important to understand the mindset of the last 40, 50 years of the established policies in the United States. 
and mainly saying that, well, after the Second World War, we are the gendarmerie of the world. There's a block on, on the Soviet side, there's another block here. Uh, we're going to sitting, be sitting on this side of the wall and we're going to control everything here. This is not the world anymore. However, there are some inst institutions in the US, uh, some of them military, who are still thinking in that manner. We could give the example of CENTCOM and Eurocom on this. While Eurocom was saying, don't use YPG, PI, we, uh, YPD, the offset of the PKK terrorist organization, work together with the Turkish authorities in Syria. CENTCOM said, no, we're going to do it with uh, some runoffs of uh, terrorist organizations and create more havoc here. Okay, so the result is here. You can see the result. So this is what I'm referring to. The first question you have to repeat for me because I really didn't get it. Um, so I'm going to ask the, another question, which is interesting. Okay. Uh, and Maybe uh, if you slow down a bit while you speak, the, 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 the voice can come better. Okay, so uh, given over 50 years of deadlock in Cyprus under UN parameters for a comprehensive solution, will Erdogan and Biden agree on an alternative two-state solution for Cyprus? Well, the Cyprus issue is, is, is very complex in itself. Um, we're going to see what's going to happen. Our stand is clear. We were for the Annan plan in the past. It didn't work out. The European Union made a huge mistake by accepting uh, a part of the island as a whole into, uh, into the European Union. Um, now we're dealing with that. Uh, so we will see. Um, but I think the, the recent uh, political changes on the island uh, will also shed some light to the future. Um, and I, think, I don't think that, uh, like I said, that um, President Biden will be able to do this by himself. He will have to work with some others as well. Um, we shall see. But I just wanted to mention one thing. There was a lot of mention about some Arabic countries in regards to dealing with issues in the region, which is very important. However, we have to see, for example, in the case, and Mr. Ramani referred to the North African countries, um, which is important. Uh, but Egypt is a very important, different player in, the, in, this, in this context. Now, you could say uh, that Egypt is uh, seen as a major player by the Israelis, by the Americans, also by, 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 by Turkey, by other countries. However, the problem in Egypt right now, from my point of view, is the government of Egypt or the um, the government that is currently uh, in the responsibility to run Egypt has question marks on it to its legality. What do I mean with that? Um, the election of the current president, uh, not everybody can call it a democratic election. And nobody does refer to it as that. So there's a problem here uh, in itself when Egypt as a major player in the region, has very, very serious, deep internal uh, problems by itself. Um, also in, in, in the political term. This is something that we have to take to, into, into account as well. And um, when you look at the Cyprus issue, Greece is important here as well, because we have to remember that the UK, um, Turkey, and Greece are guarantor countries uh, in, in the case of Cyprus, of the island. So it is important to bear that in mind as well. Um, and the current situation of the Greek administration is that we can do whatever we want, everybody's going to support us. So there's, there's another hardball thing that uh, the current US administration will have to look into. Thank you very much, sir. Uh... My next question is going to be to Dr. Melania Garson. So, uh, there's one question uh, to specific uh, Palestine Israeli conflict. Will Biden continue the adventurous ambitions of by, uh, Mr. Trump's peace between Israel and the Arab nations? And how likely would real peace be established without the Palestinian government uh, on the table? Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I think it's uh, the, the process triggered by the Abraham Accords, which is actually, for those of you people who've been following it for a long time, is not such a big surprise. It, it formalized what had been a quite a growing series of cooperation over the, a number of years, uh, underpinned by cooperation on uh, technology and uh, intelligence or technology for uh, intelligence needs and security cooperation. So that uh, those linkages between those um, Arab nations that have formally opened up, some that have not yet formally opened up, a colleague of mine at Hebrew University used to call it Israel's mistress syndrome, that uh, Israel has been within this relationship with these countries for a fair amount of time, and they've become publicly uh, advanced. They are very strong relationships commercially. They are, and it's important to have the diplomatic angle of that acknowledged. It's not something that is is able to be put into reverse, not with the way that those Gulf countries are moving towards smart cities are becoming more reliant on the type of technology that needs the cyber protection technology that uh, Israel has a competitive advantage on. So those relationships are likely to, with or without Biden, in fact, actually likely to grow, to continue uh, to their, on a trajectory of their own. They have been for a while. To the extent that this be the Palestinian uh, peace process, the Israeli-Palestinian process becomes dependent upon this or the impact that it can have on it, I think it can have a powerful impact in the effect that those, uh, the Palestinian leadership can be brought on to see the future of the vitality for everybody in the region and that there's a space to be made for getting on board within a process that many of the countries are still very committed. It's one, they've not abandoned the Palestinian peace process, but they're looking at the closer linkages as a way to be able to contribute, possibly a way of utilizing that relationship. It's not a question of, will they continue this Trump trajectory and to almost step away from that rhetoric to say, how can this relationship be used to bring the Palestinian people into the table, into the train of change that's happening into the region and then contribute to the stability of the region. But will that process keep on opening up? Absolutely, it's, it's, so it's started now, it's been there for a long time, it's started, it's going to keep moving forward. Thank you very much, Melania. And uh, there's a question in regards to the Saudi UAE. Uh, how much, uh, this is to you, Michael, uh, how much of a shift can we expect from Biden's administration regarding America's armed length support of Saudi UAE's for if you in Yemen? Yeah, good question. Um, look, if there was one war out of the many conflicts which are in the region that being, you know, the embers of Syria, you've got Libya and 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 I think the worst is is probably Yemen at the moment. And the one in which I think Obama administration officials regretted getting sucked into and would deeply like to get out of is Yemen. The question is how and what leverage could you get to get the Saudis to stop? I think it's, you know, been well reported that without a presidential veto, uh, which Trump put in twice uh, to block um, Senate and House resolutions stopping US arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Without that presidential veto, then the Saudis are in deep trouble. The, the question is this, if Biden does that, let's say thereby allowing some sort of cessation of arms sales to Saudi Arabia, does that stop the conflict in Yemen? The answer is no, it doesn't stop the conflict in Yemen. Yemen is a series of civil wars which have been exacerbated by Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Iran, who have all played various games there with various tribes, various militias, um, sometimes fighting against each other, sometimes fighting amongst each other. I think there's about eight different civil wars going on in Yemen. Um, and the Saudis would argue that they have 
legitimate border security interests, the question, of course, would be, would they then just run out of ammunition? Yes, they probably would just run out of ammunition at the rate that they burn through it. Uh, but would that stop the problem? No, is the answer. So I think what would need to happen, and, and I've spoken to both Trump administration people and people around Biden, is that they need to get a far more serious political framework around the table than currently exists. So I, I had some hope that the UN back process, and I noticed that there was a question that talked about the UN and its ineffectiveness. Um, I would agree with that person. Uh, I think that the UN has largely been ineffective in most of the armed conflicts in the Middle East region for the last 15 years. Um, but the UN process in Yemen is, is, is basically a failure. You have a very weak process sponsored by the Saudis. The question is, how do you get the Houthis to the table? What kind of compromises are they willing to make? And are the Saudis willing to accept an increased Houthi presence in government in Yemen? Would that stop violence? Um, I'm not sure any of that's possible, partly because I think if you look at this calendar year, 2020, I think that on the ground, the Houthis have been winning. This is quite out of you know, the context of what is going on between the USA and Saudi Arabia. So the question is this, if the Houthis are winning on the ground, what is the reason for them to sign a peace deal if the current conflict benefits them? And that I think is the $64 million question is, is, does it matter if you stop arms sales to Saudi Arabia when one component of this doesn't really look like they want to talk? Um, Mohammed bin Salman has been saying for about four years now that he wants to end this war. Well, there's a difference between talking and action. And I think if, if Mohammed bin Salman wanted to bring this war to an end, he would have done. So unfortunately, uh, to your uh, question, I don't see the conditions that are there at present to stop the conflict in Yemen. I think we would all want that. And by the way, I include the UK, which I think is just as guilty here um, as the US for arming the Saudis and, and you know, propagating uh, what has happened. So it's an incredibly difficult conflict that I think needs to end. I just don't think anybody has a good solution for it. Michael, one more question to you. Uh, so uh, in the event we see a strong retaliatory response from Iran with respect to the recent assassinations, what type of reaction can we expect from Biden? That's another really good question. Um, well, that would depend on what the Iranians do. So the Iranians have said that they will respond proportionately and in their own way. Now, it depends on what you think the Iranians will consider as proportionate. So, you know, I alluded to this earlier. I, I think we can all probably agree that it was the Israelis that committed the uh, committed the assassination in, in Iran. Um, does that mean that Iran goes after an Israeli target? If it's an Israeli target, I'm not particularly sure that the Americans would want to step into that debate. If it is something else, like let's say, for example, a mortar fired or an assassination attempt of a US general in a base in Iraq. I think the Trump administration set an interesting precedent. So what you saw this year and at the end of last year was an escalatory um, response from the US, which is you kill one of ours, we kill 25 of yours. What that led to eventually was, you know, after the death of one US contractor, was an escalation that then led to the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. And the Iranian response was, well, it was all over the place, wasn't it? They shot down their own civilian aircraft. They tried to fire some missiles at a US base. They injured some people, but it wasn't. Let's be honest, there is no comparison for Qasem Soleimani. I mean, he was so central to the Iranian state that you would have had to have effectively taken out all of the commanders, uh, you know, all of the, of the joint chiefs of staff, if you like, in the US to have any kind of equivalency in terms of the, the impact that it would have had. So what do you have now? How do they respond? What kind of target do they look at? It's gonna to have to be military. So Iranian proxies like Hezbollah have said, and they've been very clear that we will not target civilians in the region. We will target military assets. So if this can be kept to a military escalation, then it will be tit for tat. If it turns out that an American civilian is kidnapped in Beirut or something like that, then I think you'll be seeing a very strong US administration response. I don't think it will be as haphazard 
as what you've seen with the with the Trump administration. There will be more sustained pressure. There will also be, and I think you know this will be interesting. Will they go to the UN to discuss this in the Security Council? We've just talked about how the UN is ineffective. Well, that's partly also because Trump never really used the UN. He didn't believe in the UN. Will the Biden administration make use of the UN as another additional lever of pressure to put additional sanctions on the Iranians? That is an option, and that's something that we should be considering. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my next question is going to be to Samuel. Uh, so, so uh, will we be seeing a greater support of the GNA in Libya? And also, uh, do you think will Biden be more willing to confront UAE by Saudi's involvement in Yemen and Libya as well? Okay, yeah, definitely. So first of all, I think that, yes, there will probably be an expansion of American support to the GNA. I think that if you look at the US policy over the past year, that will be something of a continuity. So earlier this year, like right after the Turkish military intervention began, and it was uncertain whether the GNA was gonna be able to get the upper hand, the uh, American official rhetoric was that we recognize the government of national accord as the UN recognized government, as legitimate government, but there's really no place in Libya or no settlement in Libya that can be addressed without Haftar. Haftar just needs to stop the military escalations that come to the table and there'll be a place given to him. He will have a spot. Then as April to June started rolling around, particularly with the loss of al Watiya base, where the Wagner group uh, mercenaries all had to kind of flee from their barracks and it was, it was all kinds of chaos that really set back the after our position, the U.S. got more emboldened to, I think, move to make a harder pivot towards the GNA, and Turkey saw that as something of a diplomatic victory at a time in which U.S.-Turkey relations were really going on a pendulum up and down. So the the Turks uh, again try to get a statement from Stoltenberg in their favor, while the Egyptians were trying to get a statement from Merkel in favor of the Cairo Declaration. So there was this kind of battle between the Egyptians and the Turks to get European and American support. But I think the Americans in their endorsement of the GNA endorsed it, but they stopped short of fully endorsing everything about the Turkish activities because they felt as if Turkey was gonna push for more than what they were getting and maybe push for a full victory because they need reconstruction contracts are already targeting 30 billion of them. And they're, they're looking at other, other issues other than just kind of trying to deescalate the conflict. So there, so there could be a continuation of support for the GNA uh, a movement away from Haftar because his position is weakened, his image has been tarnished by his relationship with Russia. And that may not, but that may not necessarily lead to support for the Turkish military intervention. So that's why I'm yeah, that's what I'm gonna say about the GNA issue. With regards to the UAE issue and Libya and Yemen, I think that that's an interesting uh, subject. I think that obviously the nature of the Emirati interventions in both conflicts is very different. The UAE since July of 2019, since Anwar Gargash announced a transition from a military first to a peace first strategy has largely been drawing down from direct involvement in southern Yemen. Though, of course, he still maintains a, a belligerent posturing in Socotra, and they still maintain uh, relationships with a lot of the local factions, from security belt militias to the Southern Transitional Council to the participants in the Riyadh Agreement. So the UAE is already pr probably going to move away from, uh, from Yemen. Obviously, I think the Americans would probably put a harder line on Emirati efforts to force the South Yemeni secession that would uh, dis potentially destabilize the Red Sea, or if the Emiratis were to annex Socotra Island, that those more brazen attributes of Emirati policy, if they were to return, uh, I think the Americas could push them harder. But by and large, I think the Emirati presence in Yemen will be will basically take care of itself. The Emiratis were, have not really been fight, pro focusing on fighting the Houthis in recent years. They've been focusing more on Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and on their own southern agenda. So as the Biden plan to withdraw from Yemen takes shape, as will the Emirati plan in, in Yemen follow. Whether they'll retrench or whether they'll stay, it's too early to tell. With regards to Libya, I mentioned it briefly in my talk. I think the biggest uh, thing that they'll be trying to push is logistical cooperation with Russia. The use of panciers and support which the Emiratis bring to, to Libya in support of the Russian military intervention, Emirati financing of the Wagner Group, the Emirati involvement in the recruitment of Chadian and Sudanese mercenaries alongside Russian Wagner Group personnel and Syrian mercenaries, any linkages between that, that the UAE is facilitating between Haftar and Assad, since the which has been continuing since March, those aspects of the Emirati posturing in Libya, which most intersect with Russian interests and Russian military support, will be the ones that will be targeted. Aside from that, they won't be dealing with it. And just one last thing, 
I think the Emiratis have got to rethink their Libya strategy. Haftar is uh, is on his way out. They may that means they may need to uh, engage with the Guila Saleh because there's really no means in which Haftar is going to negotiate at the bargaining table. He's going to be the perennial disruptor. So they've got to find somebody in that Tobruk-based government to deal with. That's not necessarily Haftar. And whether the Emiratis are prepared for that, one doesn't know. There was one statement in June where Gargash criticized Haftar and the Southern Traditional Council as partners that kind of go their own way and don't uh, don't consult us and are causing instability, but nothing really more than that to suggest a change in Emirati strategic thinking. So the Emirates will have to reconcile to the reality, the changing realities in Libya, that Haftar and the LNA are not what they were a year ago. They're much weakened forces and there needs to be some kind of bridging with Turkey or engagement or something that preserves their interests. That's how I see the Emirati role. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, it's been a great uh, discussion and it's been a, a almost one, uh, over one hour and a half. And uh, unfortunately we are out of time, uh, but we received so many great questions and uh, from the audience and which made the discussion much more interesting. And we, we haven't uh, also uh, replied many of the questions as well, but uh, the time is, uh, running out. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and for taking your time in sharing your valu valuable thought with us. But uh, before I close uh, the session, uh, is there any from, the, from our uh, panelists, is there anything that uh, they, you would like to say? If not, then uh, okay, I will uh, thank you very much for uh, all of you for accepting our invitation and being with us. And I will also I would like to thank our participants and attendees for listening and uh, have a, a great night. Thank you very much.